So you've gone out and done the action sports thing. You film something really, really cool on your action camera and you're like, dang, that's awesome. Looks great on the back of the camera, looks good on your computer. And then you go and try and share with your friends on YouTube or on Facebook or on Instagram or whatever. And it looks like poo poo caca. Well, in this video, we are going to fix that. I'm going to bring you through my post-production pipeline. I'm going to try and keep it as simple as possible and effective as possible so that you can take the footage that you film with your action camera, make it look even better after the fact and have the right export settings so that when you upload it to whatever platform you want to upload it to, the video and that platform will play nicely together and it'll look great. So let's go. And it doesn't matter what kind of action camera you're using. It doesn't matter what kind of computer you're using. You should be able to do what I do in the same program as me, no matter what, even if you're working off of an iPad. Okay, so filming is done. You're back at your place. You've got the memory card. Um, the next thing you gotta do is take it off that memory card, put it on the hard drive on your computer. Well, I'll just say this, even if that footage is just a little bit important to you and you would like to keep it around, have two copies of it because one of those copies will fail. Hard drives and computers go all the time. SD cards fail all the time. Ask me how I know. So you've got your files on your computer. I've got some example footage here that we'll be working with. But there are two different kinds of video files out there. There's one where you're using a single lens camera, like that little guy there, that Ace Pro, and that's great. Your video file's ready to be put into your video editor to get color graded and exported, all that kind of stuff. Or you shot it with a dual lens camera like this, Insta360 X3. And in that case, you've got to put it, in that case, you've got to put it into a separate program and you've got to turn it from a 360 sphere into a 16 by nine or nine by 16 rectangle. And so really, really fast before we dive into my editing and color grading uh, software, I just want to show you what I do as far as exporting a file and the settings for that. So this is, uh, again, I use Insta360 cameras, so that's what we're going to be showing you here. This is a chin mounted X3 on oh, my chin. There's my chin. Um, and so here I am on the trail and I've got the X3 set up and we've got it in 16 by 9 format. Obviously, you can change that. Do whatever you want. This is a 360 camera. Go crazy. All right. So I'm going to put this where I want it and we're going to export it out. So because so the thing is, um, when you're dealing with uh, 360 footage, uh, so you might have an X3 or whatever, and that's like 5.3K, 5.7K. I'll have to double check on that. Uh, tons of resolution. But we're talking about that amount of pixels over the entire 360 sphere. But we're only taking like a little rectangle out of that. And so if you want like the highest quality output possible, you got to use as many of those pixels as possible. And so I find I try to export with as much of a wide field of view as I possibly can. If you're finding that you're always punching way into your footage like this, if you're always, always, always doing mega punched in stuff, that's not the strength of a 360 camera. It's not what they're made for. It's just the quality is going to degrade too, too much. Whereas if you're getting a, a ton of pixels in there by having a wider shot, looks pretty dang good. But yeah, if you're always wanting to punch in, just don't use a 360 camera or at least use it in single lens mode because that'll be better quality overall for that um, or use a single lens camera. So anyways, I'm going to include a whole bunch of pixels and we're going to go export this thing. Call it tester, tester one, horizontal. So I have a preset here. Um, here's the thing. So when you when you actually are exporting 360 footage, when you're taking out that little tiny chunk out of there, it's not the resol actual resolution of it is not going to be more much more than 1080p. But when you're exporting it, you export it as a larger file size. So instead of, you know, 1920 by 1080, I've got it at 3840 by 2160, which is ultra HD, or most people call 4K. And if I want absolute maximum quality, I export it in ProRes 422. It'll be a pretty dang big file size, but I'm just doing small clips, so it doesn't really matter to me. Um, and then I go and export, and this will give me the very best starting point possible for 360 footage. Now, if you want to retain a lot of the quality, but you just don't want to deal with the massive file sizes from that ProRes stuff, do H.265 or H.264. Uh, but when you do that, juice up the bitrate to at least 100. Start the export. Bingo, bango. That's a 360 export side of things. Let's uh, dive into my editing and color grading and exporting program of choice. <laughs> Bam. Um, oh, look at this guy. Okay, so I use DaVinci Resolve. I've been using DaVinci Resolve since 2014, I think, so 10 years now. If you're not already totally stuck into a different editing program, actually, even if you already are, DaVinci Resolve, just do it. It's the best one. It's the best one. There are pros and cons to all different pieces of software, but this one, 
for one is free and you get like 95% of everything, well, really 100% of everything you'd ever need unless you get like really pro into some things. You can go and download your own software, DaVinci Resolve software right now for nothing. And I think they even have an iPad app for it now too. So that's what we're gonna be using today as the software, but you can do the exact same thing, pretty much the exact same things I'm doing on any other software as well, like Final Cut or uh, Premiere Pro, if anybody's using that anymore. <laughs> so this is the very last video that I put out on the channel. I'm gonna make a whole new project for this so I can show you everything I do. Just to give you an example of what I do as far as my main camera and having to color grade that, which is filming right now, this is what it looks like to begin with. That's what I'm working with. And then we make it look like that. <laughs> Let's make a whole new project. Okay, so we've opened up the project and this is what we're gonna do first. We're gonna go up to file and we're gonna go to project settings. You have to set up your project settings right from the get-go. It's not that difficult. You just gotta do it right. Um, so we're talking about horizontal YouTube export right now. And so I'm gonna go 3840 by 2160 Ultra HD, even if you shot your footage in 1080p, but we'll talk about that later. Um, I shot in 24 frames a second, so we're gonna have a 24 frames per second timeline. If you shot in 30 frames per second, go and check, put it in 30 frames per second. Color management, this is the other one, two down over in color management. Um, we're gonna keep this super, super simple. There's so many crazy complicated ways of doing this, but we're gonna leave it really, really simple. We're gonna check use separate color space and gamma and timeline color space, we're gonna make it rec 709, pretty basic. And then on the output, guess what? Guess what, rec 709. And the gamma, this is important. I'm gonna assume that this shows up on PCs as well, but we're gonna go Rec 709A for your gamma, not gamma 2.4, like you nerds are gonna tell me down in the comments. It doesn't look right. Rec 709A for YouTube and Instagram. Okay, hit save. Bop, bop, bop. And here we are, ready to make some movie magic. Anytime you start using a new program, it can seem super overwhelming, but trust me, I've been using this for 10 years now, and I'll, honestly, I, I am no expert at this program. I essentially do like 10 things in this and then I kick out my videos because I don't need to do anything more than that. You've got down at the bottom here, we've got all the pages. There's a media page, cut page, edit page, fusion, color, fair light, deliver. Um, because I'm an old man and I started using this before the cut page even existed, I use the edit page. This is where I do all of the editing. If you were new to DaVinci Resolve, I think it's totally worth looking into the cut page. It sounds great, but old dog, no new tricks, thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna take my footage and I'm just gonna drag it over here underneath the master folder. Boop, and then it's just in there. Easy as that. Now if I wanna throw them all down on the timeline where I, where I can actually like do things with them, I'm just gonna take them all and I'm gonna drag them on there. And now they're on the timeline. You see, not, not difficult. So we've got a few different examples here. We've got something for snow, we got vertical, we got horizontal. We're gonna start with this one. So we've got these two clips here and both of these clips were actually in the very last video. So may as well keep this on uh, on topic. Turn that down, holy moly. Okay, here we go. This is uh, me riding, it's pretty cloudy outside. Uh, it's pretty dreary out there at the moment. And this was when I was really trying to zero out the camera. I just wanted to leave it on basically stock settings. And this is probably where a lot of people watching this video are gonna be starting from. They left their, their white balance on auto and uh, a bunch of other things just kind of let it do its thing. So this is similar to probably what a lot of people are working with. Let's see here. Now we're gonna go and color grade this thing. I'm gonna make it look extra good. Now, as I said before, um, Okay, we're just gonna get rid of all of this stuff. All right, there we go, cleared it out. Now we've got a bigger screen to work with. So again, I had this camera set into a lot of the auto settings, including auto white balance. And it doesn't matter how smart the camera is, I've said this so many times before, it's very, very rare that a camera will get the white balance right, including in this scenario. So in this clip, um, the camera is seeing a whole lot of green and a whole lot of red. And that's just what it looked like naturally. And so the camera itself is going, whoa, there's so much green and so much red. I have to balance this out. It's just gonna dump a whole bunch of blue into the image, like way too much blue to try and balance out the white balance. And now it looks bad. And I can tell it looks bad because I know one, this is not what it looked like in real life. Two, I know that my Ibis Oso paint does not look like that. It does not look anywhere near that cool. It looks like there's almost no green in it whatsoever when I know 
is pretty green. So we are going to balance this image out and it's uh, really not that hard to do. There's these little circles over here. One's a target looking thing here and the other one's a target looking thing. It says HDR. They're both super useful. We're just going to go to the regular target looking one. And over here is temperature and tint. And so one of the things I want to do is I want to bring the green back because it took out so much green. And so I'm going to take tint and you can see if I scroll to the left, we're going to be adding green in and taking away some of the red. And you can see it on the scopes there too. Let's see here. Okay. Right about to where the trees look a lot more realistic and my bike starting to look green again somewhere around there now i'm going to add in some warmth with the temperature slider right about there i think i'm trying to get i'm trying to make the ground look brown again because the ground is like pretty brown right about there and you could take little hints from like things around in and around the scene and so for example like my pants i know what my pants look like and what sort of brown they should look like and you got to trust your eyeballs on that but then too even if you just look at my stem before the stem looked way too cold uh, but now it looks balanced actually balanced all right cool next up um, we're gonna adjust the exposure a little bit this is actually isn't too too bad but see all these squiggly lines over here? These are your scopes. They're called scopes. And it's telling you where all the different colored pixels are in the image and how they're kind of spread across a brightness range. The higher up you are on this little chart or graph, uh, the brighter it is and the lower, the lower it is or the darker it is. And so for me, I'm going to use lift gamma gain. That's basically just like shadows, midtones, highlights. And I am going to raise this up a little bit. Raise up the shadows just a touch. And I always like to play around with midtones because I find that for whatever reason, it doesn't matter what brand, but um, a lot of the times action cameras just kind of like wash out the midtones. And so anytime that I can bring a little bit more like mm, a little bit more oomph into the midtones, everything looks better. Now, if you go over to the little target that says HDR underneath of it, sometimes depending on the camera, you can go over and so now we got dark shadow light. Don't, don't worry about the global one. Um, and then we can click this. And you have access to even more highlight and specular. So now these things are getting now we're getting like really, really bright up there. So highlight and specular, that's like dealing with like the bright spots in the sky. And so I want to try and bring down the exposure for highlights and see what happens. Oh, see, there you go. Yeah. So even though I've brightened up the image a lot, I can still control just the really bright spots in the sky over there and bring them under like so, so that they're not clipping. Because if you're touching the very top, you're clipping and you've lost your data. And you can also like, let's say if we're looking at, you know, the ground and everything and my bike looks right. But then now like the sky looks a little bit weird, like it's it's too brown or something or the stem were to look too brown, but everything else looks great. You can go into and specifically target the highlight sections. And you can just like pull the saturation down just in those highlight sections. So then your, the sky and the stem, which is silver, can look a little bit more neutral. So I'm gonna pull that down just a little bit. None of the stuff that I did over on the HDR wheels is all that necessary. I honestly, I pretty much do everything over here. Shadow, midtones, highlights, mess around with them. Before, after, before, after. Now when it comes to sharpness, anytime I am setting up one of my action cameras, I always set sharpness to low. Whatever the very lowest setting is on the camera, that's where I set it to because I'm going to do the, the sharpening after the fact. I don't want it to look too crunchy. So I know that the sharpness was set to low on this camera when I shot this. And so I'm going to go over to this is super confusing. There's a lot of different ways you can sharpen your, your footage, but I'm just going to do the absolute most simple way. We're going to go to something called blur. And then you're going to take radius of blur <laughs> again. I, I don't know. You take the blur radius and you drop it down by like to 48 or 49 it depends it was a pretty dark day and so i know the iso was cranked up a little bit so there's going to be more digital noise in there and the more digital noise you have the less you want to sharpen because it, it brings out all that digital noise and makes it look worse so i'm just going to add just a little tiny bit of sharpening uh, let's do 0.48 sharpen it up just a little bit before after before after great all right, now, another thing I wanna add is some saturation. So I've gone back over to the little target wheel there. And we're gonna add a little bit of saturation to it. Yeah, that actually looks more like my frame. So let's see where we're at. Let's try and look at a few different more places. Yeah, so this is before and that's after. Before, the snow looks way too blue with some red in there too. And now, it looks how it looked. 
in the moment. Turn it off. Boop. That's off. And that's on. Pretty big difference. And it really didn't take that much time. So that one's good to go. And lots of times when I have a whole bunch of multiple clips, I'll just go and take that color grade that I did on that one and I can hit Command C or Control C. And then if you're in the color page, you could just click the next clip and then hit Command V or Control V and just paste the same settings. And it'll probably be great. You might have to make a couple little tweaks, but for the most part, it's good. This is a helmet cam view. And again, we're in auto white balance here. And once again, it's just seeing a ton of green and red. And so it takes out all the green and red and you're left with almost no color, which is really too bad. So on this one, I believe the sharpness was already set to medium. And so I'm gonna leave sharpness on that one. It's already looking slightly crunchy, but now I'm gonna do the exact same thing I did with the other one, just a little bit faster. So first things first, we're gonna take some tint. We're gonna add some green back in there cause it was way too red. And then some temperature, we're gonna warm it back up to where the woods look like the woods again. That was a little bit too much green, so I'm gonna add a touch more red in. And again, all I'm doing is trying to make it look how it looked to my eye in the moment. Um, this one is, I'm gonna add a little bit of contrast. So this one here, that's contrast, and you can just click it and you can slide it up or down, add a little bit more or less contrast. And I'm not really clipping out on the sides. There's a little bit of highlight clipping going on, but not too bad. And we can go and test that. Actually, let's add some saturation first. Add a little saturation in there. It's about there. It's a bit warm. Like that. See what's going on with the midtones. Oh yeah, see, you dip the midtones down a little bit and everything just looks like, mm, it just looks like so much more body to everything. So I'm gonna drop that down, bring up the shadow just a little bit. And that's looking pretty good there. Touch too much contrast. Bring it down just a little bit. Right, maybe a little bit more saturation. Bop. That's before, and that's after. Before, after. And you can really tell, like, so this is a before shot, and if you look at the scopes over here, this little bit here is, that's the snow over in this area, and you can see that the blue, the blue channel is way, 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 way too high. See all the blue there, and then it's green, and then it's red. And now that I've balanced it out, I actually wasn't looking at the scopes when I did this, but I probably should have been, but I got it anyways. Um, let's go turn it back on. And now you can see all those colors are lining up with each other. So that's how you know that the snow is actually white. So that's great. Okay. Back this out a little bit. So those are those two clips done and dusted, and they're going to match each other pretty well. Let's, uh, let's try a snow example here. All right, so in a situation like this on a snowy overcast day, the number one thing that you kind of have to really pull out of the footage is some contrast because there's just no contrast on the snow. It all just looks blah white. So here we go. Um, our white balance was set on this one, but we did set it assuming that the sun would be out a little bit more than it was. And so you can see it's a little bit cool, but it's not too bad. It's pretty neutral. But yeah, there's just not a lot of contrast going on in there. So let's go into here and you can see right away again, if you look on your scopes, it's so useful to use these scopes, you can immediately see that this, you know, these three thick white lines at the top, that's the snow. And so you automatically already see that the snow is way too cool looking. So if you actually wanted to make the snow white and how you would have seen it with your own eyes, well, let's use this temperature slider. And we brought that, oh, see, look at that difference, hey? Such a big difference. Brought it down to there. And that, I mean, that's really it. And then uh, let's see. Tint slider, no, you know what? That was pretty good. I'm gonna leave it right about there. And so now the snow looks like nice, perfect white snow. We're gonna try and pull a little bit of contrast out of that snow. Let's see what we can do. First, I'm gonna stick with these um, color wheels here, the primaries they're called. And again, this one, it, it basically is like mid-tone. And so sometimes I just wanna like move things around and see what comes out of the image as I wing these settings around. So as I bring this down, I start to see a little bit more contrast in the snow. And so what if I, what if I brought the mid-tones down, but then I brought the highlights up and the shadows up just a little bit too. Let's see what that's done for us. Right. So already um, this was before and now this is after. 
So I brought up the brightness of the snow and we fixed the color of the snow so it actually is white. Um, but even though I brought up the brightness, we've actually managed to bring out more contrast in it as well. So you can start to see more contours in that snow for after. Now let's see here. I think we could go brighter and it'll separate things out even more. I'm going to bring up the midtones just a little tiny bit. We're going to bring up the saturation because my jacket is yellower than that. There we go. And so you got to roll through and make sure it's not going to be peeking out at all. Like as far as like the highlights getting way too bright and it is just a little bit. So I'm going to bring down the highlights a touch. This is us just absolutely on the struggle bus. We've never ridden any of this before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's not bad. It, it levels out pretty good. The other thing that you can do with this actually first, let's just go and sharpen by going to the blur tab and bring it down to it's going to be nice and clean so we can sharpen this a little bit more without it looking too crunchy. So we're going to go 0.47. I'm going to try and get a little bit more detail in the snow. So I'm going to start playing around. Oh, see, look, if you play around with those high mids for snow footage, you can see as I drop this down, look at all the detail in the snow. Obviously, other parts of the image are going to be too dark now, but that's not bad. So let's bring it down to like there and try and balance it back out again by so I'm going to bring up that just a little bit bring that up so now we've brought down just that one little tiny part of the highlight range let's see before and after before too blue very washed out no detail to having actually like decently colored snow my jacket looks right and we've got way more detail in the snow and it's nice and sharp too great all right moving on all right, so these are the X3 um, 360 shots that we exported out of the Insta360 desktop program. I wanted to show you this because again, we didn't do anything to the footage after the fact. I didn't add anything to the footage in the Insta360 app, uh, the desktop app or anything like that. This is just how it, it came out of the camera. And I wanna show you this because this is how stuff typically looks when I'm filming. I work to set up my camera settings so that I can capture really nice looking footage like this and basically have to do nothing. So when I shot this, I set my white balance according to what it looked like out there on that day. And I'm pretty sure on this day, I set it to about 6,000 Kelvin. And I set my EV compensation a little bit low so that I wouldn't be blowing out the highlights. And I know a lot of you have experienced this kind of situation with your action camera footage. When you're in really super contrasty a filming situation like this one, oftentimes the, the darker areas are super crushed and there's no more detail. And at the same time, all the highlight details are super blown out and there's no detail and it looks really bad. Um, but for this, at least on the X3, if I put it to like minus 0.5 EV and I leave it in vivid mode, it does a really nice job of hanging on to the highlights and the shadows. And it, this is a similar thing with uh, other cameras as well. So you can see in this image, let's go back to the color page here. There is, there is a lot of contrast, but it's pretty well controlled. So I don't have to worry about getting like bringing down the highlights too, too much, but I could, I can go over to the HDR wheels, go over to highlight. There it is. If I want to just bring down just some of that, some of those hot spots, so I can bring down that highlight area just a little bit right to there. And then if I really, really want to, I can go move it down into dark and shadow. I can bring up the shadows just a little tiny bit. And I'm going to go and sharpen it because I know that it was on sharpening low and it was a nice bright sunny day. So the ISO was nice and low. So I'm going to go 0.48 on this one. And to be honest, we're good here. It looks good. It's ready to go. So that's that's my typical workflow when I have, you know, full control over my footage. I just set my camera up well and I don't have to deal with it. And I've got plenty of camera setup videos already on this channel. I'll, I'll link some down below for you. And of course, it's the same for the horizontal footage. So we've got this footage here. Pretty much didn't really need anything to it at all. And we've got this footage here before and after. Like dang. And then uh, we've got these guys here for after. I actually probably bring that up a little bit for the exposure, but, and there's that before and after. Okay, cool. Honestly, when it comes to action cameras, you generally don't really have to do anything to your audio, especially if you set it up with like how I set it up 
in the last video, again, link in the description, all the action camera companies or most of the action camera companies nowadays do such a nice job with not clipping the audio and it's, it's all pretty balanced. It's nice. So we're not really even going to worry about uh, changing up the audio so much, but all right, so let's do a 4k export for YouTube. So horizontal, let's see what's up. All right, we're just going to go like this in and out points. Uh, you have to set your in and out points when you go to export something. So I went to the beginning of this clip and I hit the I button for in and I went over here and I hit the O button for out. Now it knows what part of your project you are exporting. So it doesn't export the entire thing. So you come up here, you name the project. Let's throw it onto the desktop. Now, when you're exporting for YouTube, it doesn't matter if you filmed in 1080p or in 1440 or in 2.7 or any other resolutions, you're gonna export it in ultra HD settings. And the reason for that is, is that YouTube will treat your video so much better versus a 1080p file. When YouTube sees that you're uploading a 4K file, it's background encoders give you a lot more bit depth to work with and you're just gonna get a much better looking image no matter what, even if it's 1080p and you're up it to 4K, and let's say you're watching it in 1080p on YouTube after the fact, it's still going to look way better than if you exported it at 1080p and uploaded it at 1080p. Because for whatever reason, at that resolution or lower, YouTube gives you a lot less bits to work with. So um, I'm on a Mac. I'm going to use QuickTime format. Now, this one depends on your system. I always export an H.265. And we are going to always make sure this in 3840 by 2160 Ultra HD. And so all of my footage was shot in 24 frames per second. And so the frame rate on the way out, I'm going to kick it out to 24 frames a second. Now, here's a really, 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 really important part to all this. It is the quality or the kilobits per second. Most of the time, it'll be set to automatic. I don't think so, Tim. Uh, we're going to put it to restrict to so that it will only export it at... I think personally for 4K footage on YouTube, when you're uploading it to YouTube, they'll tell you that you don't need more than like 25,000 kilobits per second or 25 megabits per second, whatever you want to call it. But I like to go 80 or above. And especially when there's a lot of fast motion, that's when you need more bits flying around. And so let's say for this one, I'm actually going to make it, well, it's H.265, so you don't have to do as high. So I'm, I'm going to do 80,000 kilobits per second. Um, I don't want to optimize for speed. I want to optimize for quality. So I don't really care about that. We're going to go to encoding profile as main and multi-pass encode. I heard from somebody that like on some PCs or whatever, there's no option for multi-pass. I don't know if that's changed now or not. That was a few years ago. But if you have the option for a multi-pass encode, do it. It makes your footage look way, way better. And then down here, we're going to go color space and gamma tag, same as project, because we already set that up for Rec. 709 and Rec. 709A for the gamma. And once you've done all of that, you can hit add to render queue sitting over here and it's not it's not rendering yet. You got to hit render all ding. And away we go. All right. So that has been rendered. And when you do that multi pass encode, you got to remember that it'll do like a pass through your footage and then it's going to start from the beginning again and do a second pass, a multi pass encode. And so, yeah, you're going to have a bigger file and it's going to be a larger file to upload to YouTube. But again, if you're wanting to share this with people in, in the kind of quality that you see on your computer, there's literally no other way to make this happen. So now vertical export. Let's check out what we have to do for that. We've got our vertical file over here. And lots of times, like if you're just putting out vertical content, when you go and start your new project, you can set it to be vertical right away. But one of the things that we often do is after we've done our YouTube edit, now it's time to cut uh, an Instagram cut for promotional stuff or whatever. So for this, I just fire up a whole new timeline. So it stays within the same project and I unclick use project settings so that that way I can go and use vertical resolution. We're going to make this uh, ultra HD. There it is. Lovely. So now you've got a whole new timeline. All your stuff just disappeared and you're freaking out. Don't worry. It's still all there. You can go up to this area here and shoot, go back to your old timeline just like that, which is still in horizontal format, by the way. And you can go and just copy whatever you want to put onto your other timeline, paste it in there. There we go. And so this was exported out of the Insta360 app at 2160 by 3840. And this project timeline is set to the same res. So everything fits perfectly. You don't have to do anything with that. And for our export, let's go over to the deliverer tab. In point, out point, done. 
Now, this is a little bit different and this is important. When it comes to YouTube, the name of the game with that is give YouTube the very highest quality format and version that you possibly can. Throw a giant video file at YouTube and you'll probably get a, a decent output out of it on the other end. But when it comes to social media apps, and let's take Instagram as an example, as the prime example, the Instagram encoders hate with a passion anything that doesn't exactly fit their parameters. Basically like there's a pipeline that it uses and if your video doesn't exactly perfectly fit that pipeline, it's gonna manhandle that footage and essentially destroy it. And it's gonna look really pixely and awful. Even if you throw a really high res file at it, it's not gonna like it. It's not gonna like it at all. And so when it comes to social media apps, you need to give it exactly what it wants for the finished product so that it needs to touch your footage as little as possible as it goes through that encoding pipeline on their end. So name it, whatever you're going to name it, put it wherever you're going to put it. And for Instagram, I usually go H264 on this one. Um, Instagram runs at 30 frames a second in general, uh, but we're going to do 24 anyways. If you're shot in 30, export it in 30, it's, it's the best frame weight for, for Instagram. But uh, anyways, so as far as the quality goes, we are not going to max this thing out over 80 or 100,000. We are going to put it at 25,000 kilobits per second or 25,000 megabits, not megabytes, megabits per second. Yes, there's a difference. Yes, it's stupid. So yeah, we're going to change this down to 1080 by 1920 um, vertical resolution. Make sure that box is clicked because that resolution is exactly what Instagram wants right now. Uh, yeah, we've got our 25,000 kilobits or 25 megabits per second. We're going to go multi-pass encode, always multi-pass encode if you can. Color space tag, gamma tag, that's all good. Rec 709 and Rec 709A. That is perfectly fine. After all that's said and done, add to render queue and hit render. And that, my friends, is all there is to it. Thanks for watching everyone. I am gonna drink this coffee and then, yeah, I think I'm gonna go for a ride.